Whales don't get cancer, but why? You might already know this, but most animals get cancer, but not whales or elephants. Isn't cancer a part of all normal living beings? It kills more than 10 million people per year, but it kills almost no whales. What makes them so special? And if we figured out why whales don't get cancer, does that mean we can finally figure out how to cure cancer completely? Or better yet, figure out how to prevent it in the first place. This is all related to a famous paradox in the field of biology called Peto's paradox. And as an oncology pharmacist, I want to explain to you what this famous paradox is. But before we can do that, we need to have a basic understanding of what cancer is. We all know that cancer is one of the leading causes of death. It's actually in second place right now, right behind heart disease. Wait, but I'm sure to most of you, myself included, getting cancer just seems so much scarier than getting heart disease. In a lot of our minds, the word cancer equals death, but the word heart disease doesn't really. Heart diseases are well studied, we know how to prevent them, we know how to treat them, but cancer just has so much mystery, so much unknown. This is actually so much like another disease from a previous century. Tuberculosis. Both drain vitality, both stretch out the encounter with death, and in both cases, the process of dying defines the disease more than death itself. And tuberculosis really defined that Victorian romanticism. It was febrile, breathless, that tinge of pink on the <laughs> handkerchief after a coughing fit. It was a disease of artists and poets. But cancer is such a modern illness. It's a disease of overproduction, of fast growth, and it's what defines the 21st century. And it's so scary because we're living through the whole trying to figure out how to not die from it part right now. So when everything is functioning normally and nicely in your body, your cells have a pre-programmed self-destruction mechanism. Different types of cells have different lifespans. White blood cells can only live up to eight hours. Skin cells live for about a month, and brain cells live forever. Well, not forever, they would die when you died. But they don't actually have a self-destruction mechanism, or that this mechanism has been turned off. I'll make a future video about the undying brain cells and brain cancer. Make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss it. There are about 30 trillion cells in our body. And between person to person, the cells are the same size. So the difference that makes someone bigger or smaller is the number of cells. Taller people have more cells and shorter people have less cells. And typically, only healthy cells in our body are allowed to divide and multiply because our body has many, many different checkpoints. It's kind of like going through TSA at the customs. They'll let the healthy cells through so the well-behaved travelers, yep, you're good. Okay, you can go through. Yeah, you look fine. But if there's a damaged cell, so like a troublemaker, TSA is gonna stop and deport them. Well, in the cell's case, they're ordered to die. But when these damaged cells somehow pass through the checkpoints, they don't get ordered to die and they somehow live on. Don't worry yet, our body has one last line of defense. It's called our immune system. The immune system has the ability to recognize these damaged cells these troublemakers that were ordered by the TSA to be deported, but somehow they were able to just hide in the airports, like Tom Hanks in the movie The Terminal. What's going on? And our immune system is really good at recognizing these strays and they're able to kill them. There's an episode of Cancer Cells in the anime Cells at Work that I haven't watched before. Let me know in the comments if you want to see a video of me reacting to that. However, if a damaged cell is so good at hiding that it dodges the immune system as well, then there we have it a cancer cell has formed. The cancer cell can start making copies of itself and form more cancer cells, and this is what we call a tumor. So the basic idea of cancer is really quite simple. You have cells that don't die, they're really good at hiding from our own body so we can't detect it, and they keep making copies of themselves. And that's exactly what makes cancer so hard to cure. Not only are we trying to find where these cells are, but we're trying to kill them while sparing our own normal body cells. On the journey to research how to cure cancer, there's this man named Richard Pito. Richard Pito is a British man and was born in 1943. He is a very distinguished medical researcher, and the main point of this video, Pito's paradox, was named after him. During his research in 1977, he discovered something that was really, really weird. In mammals, like us humans, dogs, cats, the larger the individual, 
the higher the chance that individual will get cancer. There was a really large study called the Million Woman Study that was done in the UK between 1996 to 2001 that followed 1.3 million women. And they concluded that increased cancer risk was related to increased height in adults. Another really large Swedish study was done on over 5.5 million Swedish men and women, and they found the same thing. Another study that was done on more than half a million Asians also found the same thing. So the end result? Taller people seem to be at higher risk of getting cancer compared to shorter people. But thinking about this scientifically actually kind of makes sense. Like I said in the beginning of the video, cell sizes are similar in different people. So taller people have more cells and shorter people have less cells. That means that taller people have more cells copying themselves more processes and chemical reactions happening in their bodies. So there's that slightly higher room for error. But what Pito found in 1977 doesn't match this reality at all. And that's what makes it so bizarre. A mouse, a tiny little mouse, only has about 10 billion cells in its body. Compared to humans, we have 30,000 billion cells in our body. So 30 trillion, like I said in the beginning. Theoretically then, we should be 3,000 times more likely to get cancer than mice. Also, we live much longer than mice do. And we all know that the older we age, the more likely it is for us to get cancer. If humans can live for about 80 years and mice live about two years, then we live 40 times longer than mice do. Combining the two factors then, we're theoretically... What's 3,000 times 40? Oh. 120,000 times more likely to get cancer compared to mice. But actually, the likelihood is one to one. Mice and humans have the same rate of getting cancer. And what's even more absurd is that whales have more than 100,000 trillion cells in their body, and they can live easily over 100 years old. So they should be at least 5,000 times more likely to get cancer than humans, right? But whales actually almost never get cancer. Same thing with elephants and other large animals. There's a really simple math equation that's used to calculate someone's chance of colon cancer based on their age. The equation uses factors like age, size, number of cells, etc. But if we use this equation on whales, then we would calculate that all whales, like 100% of them, should get colon cancer by the age of 80. But they rarely have any type of cancer at all. And this is the absurd reality of Peto's paradox. Within the same species, larger means more likelihood of getting cancer, but across species, this isn't true anymore. And to this day, we don't really have a full explanation of this, but there are two main theories that are trying to explain this, and I think both sound very promising. The first one is the theory of evolution. It's saying that animals that evolved to become larger, like whales and elephants, are just more evolved than humans. They just don't get cancer as likely as humans. They're, they're just built different. Why exactly do larger animals get cancer less? Well, we all know that evolution began with a single cell organism, then it evolved to multi-cell organisms, then to arthropods, then to fish, then to amphibians, then to mammals, then to us humans. The size is generally getting larger and larger. If larger animals are more evolved, then it kind of doesn't make sense in the evolutionary theory that these more evolved animals are more likely to get cancer. Cancer basically means death if not treated. And evolution wouldn't really make something more likely to die the more evolved they become. So if this theory to explain Peto's paradox is actually true, then this could only mean one thing. That these large animals have evolved something written in their DNA to control the rate of cancer. And it turns out, they actually do. We found a gene in the DNA called tumor suppressor gene. These genes are basically the commander of the TSA checkpoint guys. They'll either try to repair the damaged cells or order them to be killed. We have one copy of this gene. Elephants have 20 copies of this gene. So basically, these large animals have evolved mechanisms that can suppress cancer many, many times better than us humans. I actually have a personal hypothesis that's kind of related to this, but it's, um, kind of creepy. If an animal develops cancer before they had the chance to give birth to babies, it would leave no offsprings in this world, right? It's actually been shown in studies that animals have evolved to delay having cancer until after the age of reproduction. It's like mother nature is saying, oh, hey, you're still young. 
I won't give you cancer yet. Cancer can wait. Yeah, go have babies. Go, go, go. And then once you're old and useless to natural selection, well, there's no big benefit from preventing you from having cancer anymore. So mother nature is like, oh good, you've had your kids. Yeah, good, good. Well, um, here's a higher chance for you to get cancer. So the creepy part is, statistics show women who have never given birth have a higher chance of getting breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Now I know, we're still trying to explain this scientifically. Maybe pregnancy is giving women some sort of protective hormone, so they're not as likely to get these types of cancer, but it just sounds like nature is trying to kill us off for not being useful and reproducing. The second theory to explain Peto's paradox is that there is a possibility that these tumors can grow so large, a new type of cell start to develop, and they start leaching off the nutrients and resources of the tumor, and then eventually killing it. This is called the hypertumor theory. In humans and smaller animals, once the tumor reaches a certain size, it takes away so much nutrients and resources from the rest of our body that our organs will just collapse and will die. But since these large animals are so, um, large, they can have the same size of tumor casually in their body, but they might not even realize it's there. The hypertumor theory says that when these cancer cells are copying themselves, a mutated copy might go rogue, and it takes advantage of all these nice loot boxes of nutrients right in front of them. And they start competing with the original cancer cells. Because it will take a relatively large tumor to kill a relatively large animal, it actually gives more time to these hypertumors to start to develop and steal resources and eventually kill the original cancer cell. So from all that we know about Peto's paradox and the explanations, can we actually use them to cure or prevent cancer? Actually, yes. There is a class of drugs to treat cancer called gene therapy. In the evolution theory of Peto's paradox, there is a gene called the tumor suppressor gene that we only have one copy of, but elephants have 20, right? What if we can invent a drug to target this specific gene and make it work better? Or better yet, introduce more copies of the gene through virus vectors. This is definitely a growing area of research in cancer treatment, and there are several drugs already like this in clinical trials. So I'm super hopeful to see the results. Actually, the cancer hospital that I work at does a lot of clinical trials. Although I can't talk about them here, it's always so exciting to see new drugs being developed and tested and hopefully deliver better cancer results. Hopefully you found this video educational and entertaining. If you liked it, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more contents like this. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.